Happy and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar on agroforestry in Scotland. As Pop has explained, this evening we have three presentations taking different views on putting agroforestry into practice. And I'm really encouraged by the interest that there is out there. Um, we've had so many people sign up for this webinar um, and it bodes well for the risk group that we intend to form after this webinar takes place. Um, you know, we're hoping to look at workable, practical ideas to integrate livestock and trees. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, while we're looking at three examples this evening of, like I say, putting agroforestry into practice, there is a lot of experience out there. Um, and this is shown just by this starting slide, um, because none of these sites are actually on the presentations tonight. Uh, this one down the bottom right hand corner is Balfrax Estate. Um, up here is Mains of Fintry. And um, both of these, the landowners, farmers have put their own ideas into practice and come up with very practical ideas of how to do silver pastoral systems. I've actually used the experiences from visits to both these areas um, in this design over here on the left, which um, we're hoping to actually plant this winter uh, it's on the farm in Midlothian. So it just shows the value of knowledge, knowledge exchange, which is well, what this risk group we hope will be all about. Um, I'll just briefly touch on my own um, my own experience, which is not actually using the web, because, oh, there we go, it finally works. Um, now, I've got 35 years experience in, in woodland management, but, um, and my interest started when I went out to Nepal, and there the woodlands are totally integrated into the farming system, uh, which is why the, photos I've got are not so much of trees here, but the animals involved. Um, you can actually see some trees in the background here, which is um, on the, that's the bottom photo on the left uh, with the bridge there. So behind the bridge, there's some sal forest, some shoria robusta, which basically every dry season is heavily, heavily lopped by the villagers um, to feed their animals. They rely heavily on a tree fodder in Nepal. They then collect the fertilizer, the manure uh, from particularly the water buffalo and that's spread in the um, hill terraces and um, is vital for the fertility of the soil. So it's a long standing, it's centuries old cyst agroforestry system um, in Nepal and that certainly stimulated my interest. I then went, went um, to work in Bolivia. Um, Can which... just interrupt you one moment? Yep. Um, had a couple of reports that the sound's not working very well. Um, oh, I don't know. Can you can you raise your hands if you can hear us using the webinar? Raise your hands if you can hear us. Okay, so it must just be the odd um, participant that can't hear very well. Connection. I'll move the microphone slightly closer to my mouth, but hopefully it's clear. Okay. Yeah. Carry on then. Okay. No, I was just saying I, I then went to work in South America and Bolivia and doing some agroforestry research, but unfortunately I don't have photos of those. The ones I do have is when I returned to the UK and um, I was lucky enough to have own small farm and, and woodland and uh, had a flock of soy sheep um, and a few Shetland cattle and very much tried to put my agroforestry ideas into practice. And actually, well, there's a hedge and some uh, field trees, but actually the key bit uh, of my farming system here was this sort of scrubby area at the top of the hill, um, which was thorn, uh, ash, hazel, um, and, you know, the cattle loved it in there. They spent an awful lot of time in there. It was my outdoor lambing shed. I had no outdoor buildings at all. They were all the livestock were out all year round. and. You know, I heavily relied on that piece of land for, for managing the livestock. Okay, but um, what tonight is, a, well, what, what I should say, I've, I've now, don't, unfortunately, don't have the livestock, moved back to Scotland, and as a, basically, a woodland advisor, I'm very keen um, and very much see the benefits of integrating livestock and trees and um, 
thereby sort of in, increasing tree cover throughout Scotland um, because I, I think it's got major benefits to bring. But challenges as well, and I think some of the presentations tonight will show that. Um, the Agroforestry Risk Group. Now, this was initially we were going to start this before the lockdown with a visit up to Glen Sauch and, and, and actually look at the trials there and, and, and take people interested in forming part of this agroforestry risk group up there. I think by doing it as a webinar, it's opened up to a far greater audience. I think that's brilliant. Um, what we're hoping is that people after this webinar will sign up to become part of this risk group. It is a commitment. Um, we're hoping to run about three meetings after this up until the end of October, which I'll come on to in a minute. But you know, that's what we hope people to to join in and form part of this this group. Now the focus of the group will be looking at integrating trees and livestock. Um, but exactly what we do will be driven by the participants. Um, basically, we're aiming to create a peer to be a um, network amongst farmers who are doing agroforestry in Scotland. Um, so at the end of this webinar, please complete the survey that will be sent out to people. This is one is to see who wants to join the group and that also to help us understand the questions, experiences and challenges you do have so that this will help form the direction that the risk group will take um, afterwards. Now, I've been talking a lot about RIS and the Rural Innovation Support Group, um, and this is what we're intending to achieve. These are the objectives we hope to achieve. So, with the group, we're hoping to explore the potential to integrate livestock and trees on Scottish farms with a focus, particularly on problem solving, overcoming difficulties, challenges that are posed by agroforestry in Scotland and developing workable and practical ideas um, solutions to those problems. To some extent, we hope to feed back um, to Scottish Government um, uh, planning on the grant assistance for agroforestry. We know it's not perfect at the moment. And so ideas that we can feed back to them, I'm sure would be appreciated. Um, but the overall aim is basically to see more trees on livestock farms. Um, like I said earlier, the risk group, we, it may be that we form a couple of groups after this if, if there's sort of divergent interests and ways of going ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll see what, what people want, basically. But either our risk group or a couple of risk groups um, will be formed, and we hope to meet three times from now until October. Basically, those meetings will be to go over the issues, the problems people have, and work out potential solutions um, put together a project pr proposal that addresses the needs and ideas of the group. And then hopefully we can use this as a basis for further project funding applications. But um, that's the introduction to what the, the purpose of this webinar, but I'll now hand back to Poppy, who will explain a little bit more about the structure of the webinar and also introduce the first presentation. Perfect, thank you, Stephen. Um, so our speakers have been given 15 minute slots to deliver their talks and this will be followed by a question and answer session. Um, please bear with us as we do try to address the questions, um, but do understand with this plan, with the number of people on the webinar, we may not get to everybody's question, but we'll endeavour to follow up on answered questions where possible. Um, with the different perspectives of the speakers, I'm also going to encourage questions between the speakers to really add value to having them all online at once. Um, and I just thought I'd address just a couple of questions just that have been uh, fired through already. Um, there's been a couple of comments as to why um, agroforestry we're focusing in just on livestock. And I guess for these RIS projects, we just focused, we just wanted to keep the, the concept relatively narrow and manageable in the first instance, but I absolutely agree there is um, applications of agroforestry or arable land as well. So unfortunately we, well, I'm afraid to say that we are sticking with the livestock theme as that's more relevant to Scotland for the purpose of this webinar. However, I do agree there is an application for arable. Okay, so with that said, and keeping us on track, let's, first up, let's hear from uh, Dr. John Holland from 
Good evening, everyone. My name is John Holland, and I'm a research ecologist based at SIUC's Cutton and Octotire Farms. Uh, this evening, I would like to talk to you about a recent agroforestry plot that we have established at Kirkton and Octotire, and some of the other farm woodland expansion that we have undertaken over the past few years. Kirkton and Octotire Farms are situated between the villages of Tyndrum and Crean Larrick in West Perthshire in the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park. I like to think of the farm as the chicken in the northwest corner of the park. The estate is a centre for research and demonstration into sustainable land management in hill and mountain areas and is the location for SRUC's Hill and Mountain Research Centre. Back in 1995, we had very little woodland on the estate a uh, few conifer and mixed woodland blocks on the inby ground and some remnant semi-natural woodland in a couple of steep sided gorges. By 2019, our woodland cover had increased by over 270 hectares. And this included 12 and a half hectares of native Scots pine woodland, Forty three hectares of native broadleaved woodland, and over two hundred hectares of mountain woodland and scrub. I have wanted to have a demonstration plot of silver pastoral agroforestry on the inby ground at Kirkton for a number of years. And now, thanks to funding from the Lot Lomond and the Trossachs National Park, we've been able to establish a small block of agroforestry, which we can use for demonstration and research purposes. As the trees grow, we will be able to show land managers the multiple benefits that agroforestry systems can bring. This is a drone image showing some of the inby ground at the farm. The inby fields are vital for the farm, particularly at lambing, but they are very exposed with limited shelter, with the wind and rain blowing up the strath. So the agroforestry and shelter belts that we have planted recently will provide vital shelter in the future for the ewes and lambs. A half hectare block of agroforestry was planted earlier this year at the beginning of March in one of the improved permanent pasture fields at Octotire. This field on the floodplain of the River Fillon hasn't been reseeded in recent years and isn't currently used for silage. 100 individually protected trees were planted at approximately seven metre spacing in a block five trees wide and 20 trees long. A mix of native tree species were planted, alder, downy birch, aspen, cherry, pedunculate oak and rowan. We were restricted to using native species because of the grant from the National Park, but I would have considered planting other species such as sycamore if we hadn't been restricted to native species. The trees all came from a local nursery at Tenolt, which is our closest nursery. All the seed was sourced locally from Argyle, and the trees were all grown in Tenolt, which has a very similar climate to Kirkton. It was very important for us that the trees were locally and sustainably sourced, both in terms of a plant health perspective, but also so that they would have the best chance of growing successfully. The trees were planted in species blocks, with the alder planted in the wetter ground at the two ends of the plot, 
and the oak and cherry in the drier middle section. The trees were individually protected using a 1.5 meter high net cage made from two millimeter gauge weld mesh with 50 millimeter squares and a cage diameter of 45 centimeters. This was supported by two wooden posts. In addition, each tree was protected by a volgard and was given 12 grams of high phosphate tree fertilizer. A mulch of waste wool was put around each tree to reduce weed competition. This is a view of the agroforestry plot looking southeast towards the Queen Larrick Hills in the distance. The cages provide the trees with protection from browsing, but the sheep will still be able to graze the pasture between the trees. And the avenues between the tree rows are wide enough for a tractor so that fertilizer can still be spread onto the grass. The site will be used both for demonstration and research purposes, showing farmers and land managers how agroforestry can be integrated into a hill farm system. Agroforestry can, uh, can benefit productivity, climate change mitigation, flood mitigation, biodiversity and landscape, as well as animal health and welfare. This small block of silvo pastoral agroforestry will provide multiple benefits, including shelter and shade for livestock, timber production, improved drainage and soil conditions, carbon storage, and habitat for woodland invertebrates and birds. The specification that we used for the cages followed that outlined by Scottish Forestry for the agroforestry option under the current forestry grant scheme. It isn't cheap to establish agroforestry using these specifications. For each cage, the material costs were £15.95, including VAT. On average, it took approximately 33 minutes of labour to install each cage, which worked out at £10.46 for each cage. The labour involved transporting the materials onto the site, marking out the plot, installing the posts, planting the trees, adding the fertiliser and inserting the volgards, building and installing the weld mesh cages and finally adding the wool mulch. The total cost for each cage, including labour, came to £26.41. The Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park funded the project through their tree planting grant scheme and the grant of £1,500 covered the material costs but not the labour costs. If we had established the plot under the Scottish Forestry Grant Scheme, we would have been able to get an establishment grant of nine pounds per tree. There was clearly a substantial initial cost involved in establishing an agroforestry system. There are, however, multiple benefits, which include shelter and shade for the livestock, but also wood products. And if the trees are pruned and managed properly, which I hope they will be, some of this could be high quality timber. Over the last few years, we have carried out some other farm woodland planting that I would uh, like to talk about briefly. In 2017, we installed 10 tree boxes in a small area of wood pasture with scattered mature downy birch trees. Again, this was done with help from the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park, this time through the Natural Heritage Grant Scheme. These tree boxes were post and rail enclosures with a barbed wire top, which would protect the trees from sheep, cattle and deer. The downy birch saplings that were planted were also protected in tubes, principally to protect them from brown hers, of which we have many. The area of wood pasture was quite small within a large grazed permanent pasture, and some of the old downy birches were dying so we planted these new trees so that the shelter and shade that the old trees provided would continue into the future. 
the material costs for each post and rail box came to £62.38, including VAT. There are, of course, labour costs on top of this. So this is an expensive method of protecting trees. Wood pasture and agroforestry systems provide important habitat for a number of bird species, such as the spotted flycatcher here, which is common at Kirkton in the existing bits of old wood pasture. I put up an owl box in one of the old downy birches soon after the tree enclosures were erected. And within just a couple of months, it was being used by a barn owl. Also in 2017, we planted 30 saplings in weld mesh cages in another area of mature downy birch wood pasture beside the River Phil and at Octa Tyre. This was also funded through the National Parks Natural Heritage Grant Scheme. We planted 20 downy birch. And 10 rowan. Again, the trees were sourced from Tenult trees. These trees will help to maintain the small area of wood pasture. And again, in 2017, using funding from the National Parks Natural Heritage Grant Scheme, we planted 40 riparian trees in five groups of eight trees within one of our fenced water margins on our in-by ground. We have over two kilometers of fenced water margins, which are rich in tall herb and wetland plants and invertebrate species. And they are used by a number of bird species, including stone chat, wind chat, kingfisher and barn owl, as well as a number of mammal species, including water shrew, otter, and the rare water vole. The planted trees will provide additional habitat within this water margin. One mammal species that has recently appeared on the farm is the beaver. And it will be interesting to see what impact these animals will have on our riparian trees and other imbi woodland resources. This is a trail camera image of one of the beavers at Kirkton, uh, felling a willow tree. Although not classic agroforestry, shelter belts are a form of agroforestry. And as part of the Scottish Government's Agri-Environment and Climate Scheme, we established two shelter belts on the in-by ground at Kirkton, each one with 165 native broadleaf trees. The trees were protected by tule tubes and the shelter belt block was defenced. These shelter belts will provide invaluable shelter for the ewes and lambs using the adjacent in by fields, provide habitat for invertebrates, birds and mammals, and also potential wood products like firewood. I hope this short presentation has given you some idea of what we have been doing in terms of farm woodland expansion and agroforestry at Kirkton and Octotire in recent years. And I look forward to showing farmers and land managers and anyone else around our agroforestry plot and other woodlands in the near future. You can find out more about our agroforestry and woodland at Kirkton in a farm advisory service podcast on the FAS website. And there is lots of information about agroforestry and farm woodlands on the Farm Woodland Forum website, which I would encourage you all to have a look at and new members to the forum are always welcome. Thank you very much. Excellent, thanks John. Um, it's a really interesting presentation. Uh, as Poppy said, if I just uh, ask um, Donald and Peter, first of all, if they've got any questions um, uh, for John uh, before we open it out. 
Uh, John, just just a quick question. Um, obviously, I, I saw the two two aspens in in the mix there. Can I ask what the rationale was uh, for choosing aspen in the first place, and then why only two? <laughs> <laughs> I had I had hoped to put more aspen in. The reason there were only two is because that's all that were left in the nursery. Right. As you'll know, the difficulty with aspen is getting hold of uh, of you know local material, and yeah. so that, that's that's why. Um, but you know, I was keen on trying aspen out. You know, having spoken to you as well, uh, you know, but uh, but that's unfortunately all that was left. Okay. <laughs> Potential okay. <for> the future. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, Peter. A any other questions? Well, um, on that note, there's been a couple of questions come in as to why Sycamore was included in the mix. Then. Why Sycamore wasn't? Was. Um, was. Well, no, it wasn't. No, I would have done. I would have done if, if I could, but I couldn't. Oh, sorry. Uh, why would you consider yeah, it? Yeah, not yeah, native. Yeah. Okay. Not native, yeah. So, I mean, we were restricted to using native species because it was a national park uh, yeah. grant, you know, um, and and they were also keen on having a mix of species rather than it all being a single single species block. But uh, so, why would you have been inclined to include it if you could? Why would I have? Uh, I would have because. Um, because it's been used in agroforestry trials before, it produces good timber, it would grow well, uh, it would grow quite quick. Uh, we we do have sycamore on the farm and they do do quite well. Uh, I mean, if to be honest, of course, if I, if I could have done it, I would have had ash being the dominant species, but of course we can't and we, know, we all know why. Um, so that that's... I, I, off, I see sycamore as, uh, you know, a, an alternative to ash, so I would certainly have had some in there, at least to try anyway. Um, another question is why fertilizer was required? Um, I, I did that because we planted quite a lot of trees on that in by ground and they've, some of them haven't taken terribly well. So I, I decided that I would just give everything a bit of a boost. Um, the ground, it does get fertilizer, but with two and a half meters of rain, the nutrients soon get washed out of the, the soil at the site. So I just thought, I'll just give it a go, see how, how they do. I've got another question uh, for, for John, if that's possible, Poppy. Yeah. I, I just. You mentioned you used sheep wool for mulch, and I just wondered yep. how well that is working. Uh, again, it was uh, partly because we had a, a bag of waste wool bits in the shed, and I thought, well, you know, I want to try and use something to create a mulch. We do have a problem uh, with with some of the cages that we've done on the uh, bit of wood pasture were a lot of growth of uh, grasses and uh, another competition has occurred so I wanted to put a mulch on and I thought well you know we've got this waste wool I'll try it see how it do how it works I mean it'll at the moment you know it's difficult to know but uh, how, how it'll do but uh, we'll, we'll wait and see I'm I'm a little bit concerned that we planted the trees in in March and uh, it it hasn't rained hardly at all at Kirkton in April uh, and so I'm I'm hoping that the trees will be okay uh, and I'm hoping that that wool mulch will have actually held some of the water in the in the soil uh, uh, with the trees so we'll we'll wait and see though. Great, thank you. And um, we've got a couple of questions about the fencing around the cages. So, would uh, one was suggesting whether plastic mesh guards wrapped around two posts of suffice rather than the metal fence tree cages? Yes, I, I mean it's again. I mean the reason why we used that specification is because I wanted to use the same as is specified under the 
forestry grant scheme in Scotland. So that's why we did it. Uh, I suspect that plastic netting, you know, solid plastic netting would probably do a, a reasonable job. Uh, they, these metal ones are very sturdy, but even so, uh, they probably wouldn't stand up to cattle. Um, they, they would, they would cope with a bit of uh, rubbing by cattle, but not a lot. Uh, so, uh, and I think you know, plastic certainly wouldn't at all. But so, so that's why we use the metal. And a couple of interesting questions. So, um, whether the beaver browsing uh, has there been any seen on the younger trees yet? Are you worried about that at all? Uh, so, at the moment, uh, no. Um, there's not. There's not been any evidence on any of the younger trees. Um, I see. I see a lot of uh, beavers and beaver damage in, in this this area around uh, the the Upper Tay catchment. We've we've now got a a very healthy population of beavers, and what what we what you see out there is that they they target particularly willow and aspen are the two species that they go for. They tend to go for the bigger uh, uh, middle middle age trees uh, where they bark stripping and felling, uh, and they're not really going for for young trees as such. And so. It, but it is a it is a question, and it's a it's a question that's been um, thought about in this certainly in this local area about what um, what sort of responsibilities will forestry authorities have in terms of land managers planting trees and then beavers eating them all, and uh, you know whether they'll have to be replanted and all this sort of issue. So so beavers are. Uh, an interesting thing in the mix, but as far as I'm concerned, the the positives definitely outweigh the negatives. And um, just a final, and I'm sorry I'm not getting around every question. There's some excellent questions in here. I'm just going to merge a couple. And um, okay. so somebody's asking, well, for one, basically, how long is it going to be until we have sort of significant uh, shade and shelter off this site? Um, and alongside that. Is the spacing going to produce decent timber? So how long is it going to get decent shade? And um, are we going to get decent timber? So the two sort of benefits of the whole yeah. uh, system. Yeah, um, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, in the climatic conditions that we have at Kirkton, uh, tree growth is relatively slow, uh, uh, even on the better ground. So, but I would be hoping that uh, within uh, uh, Within ten years, they will be providing some some shelter and a, and a bit of shade. Uh, but you know the the tree growth is very different in uh, Highland uh, Perthshire than it is in uh, in the south of England. So uh, it, it it will take time. As regards you know timber and the spacing of the trees. So this. The spacing is 200 trees per hectare. Uh, I it would be interest, It will be interesting to see how the trees themselves do. Uh, trees will, I think, with a lot of the agroforestry evidence, suggests that uh, a bit closer spacing, the trees will grow better, and then you thin the trees out rather than starting off at a perhaps a, at a wider spacing. So, but it, I, I, again, we'll just have to wait and see. I mean. Uh, we have trees higher up at Kirkton, which have been in uh, in the ground for 25 years and are still only a metre high. Uh, that's at a much higher altitude, but it just shows that, uh, yeah, it, it will take time. But there's no rush for these things. Great. Well, I think that flows quite nicely on to our next speaker. And um, so just to say thank you very much, John. As always, you paint such a rich picture for Kirkton and the plans there. Um, it's great to see some photos of the wildlife um, improvements there. So thank you so much for that. Um, but like I say, this leads on really well to our next speaker because he's very passionate, not only about um, his livestock production, but also about forestry. So he's quite a nice, um, it's quite a nice balanced perspective. 
Um, he also has the benefit of uh, seeing observations of a trial that was set up 32 years ago. Um, it's quite famous within Scotland, or at least within the research world, as one of the earliest, or if not the only, agroforestry trial in Scotland anyway. So he has got the benefit of the long-term perspective there. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, and that is Donald Barry. He's the farm manager at Glencroft. So I'll pass on to you, John. Welcome to Glen Soch. Uh, my name is Donald Barry, and I've been the manager at Glen Soch now for 19 years. So that gives me quite a long view on the work that's been carried out here. But actually, agroforestry at Glen Soch was first thought of in the 1980s. And when I came to Glen Soch in 2001, the trial was not mature by any means, but it was well underway. In this slide, you can see an overview of what was created. And these trees were all planted around 1988. And in the view, you can see um, the, the species that were planted. We have in the top right, sycamore at 400 stems per hectare. Below that, we've got sycamore at 100 stems per hectare. And then in the lower left and middle of the picture, you can see Scots pine and larch both of these planted at 400 stems per hectare. And in this matrix, we have quite a lot of grass. Now, some of those grass plots were originally planted with larch at 100 and 200 stems per hectare, and the larch did so badly that it was removed early in the life of the trial. If I move on to the next slide, it gives a slightly closer up view of, in the center of the picture, the Scots pine at 400 stems per hectare, and incidentally, you can see that there is still some grass under that Scots pine. I always think that's a bit counterintuitive, um, but the grass has survived under the Scots pine, whereas to the left, we have a large plot, also at 400 stems per hectare. And there is no grass at all under that larch, and there hasn't been for about 15 years. But what you find there is a bed of dry needles. And the word bed is appropriate because we actually winter sheep in this area, and sheep like to lie in there. Great shelter. And to the right of the Scots pine, we have one of those grass plots. And in fact, in the original trial, some of the plots remained unplanted because every good trial, and this one was replicated three times, every good trial has a control. So the unplanted grass plots were the control plots. Moving on to the next slide, what we found out from the original agroforestry trial was that it is possible to create woodland in a grazed environment. And this was done by individually protecting the trees. The grassland production was sustained for the first 10 years. And only after that, it began to tail off. And in fact, it was also found that the grassland production was enhanced during some dry seasons that took place in the middle 1990s. And it was thought that the shading effect of the growing trees had actually protected the grass and prevented it from burning off. Things that we probably knew already were that trees planted at lower densities grew less well and were more heavily branched. But again, counterintuitively, the, the sycamore that was planted at 100 stems per hectare grew particularly badly and was very heavily branched. Um, trees planted at that very low density had no advantage at all over trees planted at higher densities. On our Windy Hill foot site, um, wind was a real problem and it caused damage, particularly to the larch. And I'll pick up on a point that John has just made about applying fertilizer. One of the problems in the, the agroforestry site, which was being managed as a grassland site for the benefit of a flock of greyface ewes, was that quite a lot of fertilizer was being applied much more than would ever be applied or ever be available to trees growing in a normal forest environment. And that led to some quite wild growth, as you might say, and made the trees very prone to damage. So we have some larch now standing at about, well, it, it, let's say it's 40 years of age, 
and a lot of that's still leaning sideways. Um, species should be chosen to suit the site. So why did we grow Scots pine, larch, and sycamore at Glensoch? Well, one of the reasons was that the Glensoch experiment was part of a national network, and sycamore was it, it was common to all the sites right across. Scots pine was chosen because it was suitable for Glensoch, and larch was chosen, I think, because it was reckoned to be a suitable forestry tree and would grow well on the brown earth sites at Glensoch, and that was certainly the case. Um, what we also found was that biodiversity in the agroforestry environment was significantly enhanced. So some very strong positives that I've already touched on. The mosaic of shelter woodland is a desirable stock rearing environment, and we like grazing our sheep and cattle occasionally in that environment, and the animals clearly enjoy being there. And as I've already mentioned, it reduces the need for livestock housing, and it gives shelter where none previously existed. Do we like what we have created? Absolutely. It's very pleasing to the eye. The mosaic of habitats is it, it, it looks good in the environment. Furthermore, it's a source of firewood. We're always on the lookout for that. And at the moment, or very recently, we've been felling some of that sycamore that I mentioned, the heavily branched stuff. Um, and finally, as we now know, these trees sequester carbon. But, but perhaps less obviously, the soils that the trees are growing in are also a huge carbon store. Quite a lot of work has been done by our science community on that. So what challenges have, were met during the planting of the agroforestry system? Well, we found that a high standard of management is required. The tree stakes and nets need continual maintenance. And let's reflect on the fact that the sheep, because there were no cattle there in the early years, but there were sheep from day one. The sheep were always trying to get at the trees and therefore continual maintenance was a given. Individual tree protection is expensive, and John has already touched on that. And in a livestock system, farm animals will always have first call on management time. So if there's a problem with the trees or the tree guards, then that will usually have second call on the manager or stockman's time, whereas livestock work will always have first call. In our livestock sector today, um, the whole industry, I would say, is slightly understaffed. We can't do all the stuff that we would like to do on our farms. Um, I know that there are always jobs that I'd like to be doing if I had more labor. Um, the agroforestry system is complex and it produces low value output. And it was always hoped that species could be introduced to the site that would add value. Um, come on to that in a moment. The point I've already made is that low, di low density planting will always produce low value timber. And something that has come at home to roost very recently is that a load of plastic waste will be generated. Perhaps not so recently, because in my almost 20 years at Glensoch, we have removed trailer loads of tree guards from the site, and there's still more to come down. So, the James Hutton Institute and the Forestry Commission have looked at barriers to adoption of these systems. Why are farmers not grasping this technology and planting trees and having more agroforestry on their land? And what we think is that there's limited silver, silvicultural knowledge in the livestock community. There's a lot to learn. And a point that I would add here is that systems which are inherently complex are usually to be avoided. And there's a caveat to that unless the product has significant added value. And that comes back to planting trees that are, that, that are valuable. And the but statement, unfortunately, is that but the product in our case is only fuel wood. And that fuel wood has taken quite a lot of time and energy to extract, because no one likes to have to process a branchy tree. Another problem that's it's a man-made problem is that land that's planted with agroforestry trees is rendered ineligible for less favored area support payments, but it is still eligible for basic payment. Um, that industry-wide problem that most farmers are short of time and some are short of expertise 
And if you're planting a crop that has an end date of, say, 30 years, then it will be very difficult to visualize what the end product might look like. But we do have some examples, and visitors to Glen Soch are always welcome. Anyway, given all these problems, I've been pondering what we might do at Glen Soch if we were asked to plant more trees in our in-by ground. And I should say at this point that we're always planting trees at Glen Soch, but we tend to focus that effort on the less capable land. So I, I've roughed up a hypothetical scheme where I've taken the METS field, which is one of our silage fields, roughly six hectares in size, and I've been thinking what I might do with the METS field to grow some timber in it and to, excuse me, maintain livestock production over at least part of the ground. And I hope you can see the map. The light green plots are roughly 1.5 hectares in size, and there are three of them. And in my hypothetical future, those plots will be rotationally grazed, whereas the cross-hatched dark, dark green plot on the north and northwest side of the field will be planted with trees. And what we might plant there, I'll come on to in a moment. What you can't possibly know is that the cross-hatched dark green land is actually also imperfectly drained and probably the least capable part of the field. So if I were to plant that, I would remove some difficult ground and I would also create shelter. And I would turn an awkwardly shaped field into a, an almost square field. And what might the Mets field look like in 30 years' time? So I took this snap of a few ewes and lambs that had recently been released from the lambing shed. Well, they have a whole paddock to themselves, but they've got lots of company now. And in this field, we have a system of grazing paddocks, also about 1.5 hectares in size. And on the northwest side of the field, we have a shelter belt of Norway spruce that was probably planted around 1970. And it's only Norway spruce. And what we might plant in the Mets field, I'm going to come on to in a moment. So main points to note here is that paddock grazing, rotational grazing, will increase grass utilization. And the point I'm making here is that we, it should be possible to obtain the same amount of production from a smaller amount of land. And you could therefore countenance releasing some land for tree planting and still have the same number of animals. So in my hypothetical scheme, one of the four paddocks becomes woodland. But am I going to allow sheep to graze in that woodland? Well, not in the early years, because I'm saying that I'm going to plant at a high density to grow straight trees. Well, with no grazing during the establishment years, the, the big saving is that no individual tree protection will be required. And here at last, I get to the point of what I might plant. So my long-term species on that stiff clay ground will be oak. And I hope no one tells me that oak grows too slowly because it, I've got lots of oak at Glen Soch. As long as you look after it, it will romp away. And I'm going to mix some spruce or other conifers into the oak as a nurse crop. What I'm thinking is that the nurse crop will be removed between, say, years 10 and year 30. And in the long term, the oak will remain. And it's quite possible that sheep and indeed cattle will be allowed back into that ground at some point in the future. Um, question I was going to put to John is that um, had they considered using conifers at, at Curtin and Ochter Tyre as a nurse crop? And I noted his comments about the species had to be native. And I'm absolutely of the opinion that I want to plant native trees at Glen Soch, and I've only recently come around to thinking that I might bow to planting some Sitka spruce uh, as a nurse crop, but it's only there for the short term. So you're probably wondering what all this is going to cost, so I've roughed up a budget. Uh, here we have a, some statistics about the site, so 1.5 hectares. Plant spacing, I'm saying six feet which is about 1.8 meters, and that gives plants per hectare of just over 3,000. So on this one and a half hectare site, we're looking at, say, 4,600 trees, and I'm using a labor rate of 15 pounds an hour. 
I'm reckoning that uh, that 30% of the trees will be oak and that 70% will be Sitka spruce. So the costs that we have here are fencing, and you'll note that we're not fencing the whole site. We only have to put a cutoff fence in because the field, after all, has a perimeter fence at the moment. And I'm using expensive fencing, but it would be quite possible to use electric fencing, and we have lots of electric fencing at Glen Sock anyway. Um, in smaller sites, I've I've actually put in a few trees where I've simply cut off a corner and excluded grazing animals with an electric fence, cheap and easy to build and easy to take down again in the future. We're not doing any mechanical ground preparation beyond hand scraping, and we should only need that for the oak. So we're scraping away a small bit of topsoil or a small bit of turf, I should say, and then we're going to pop the oak tree in. Um, we've got the plants. Um, we've got Sitka spruce at 30 pence and oak at 40 pence. We've got a planting cost of 15 pence per tree. We've got Volgards for the oak. You'll note that John also used Volgards at Curtin. And very importantly, we've got a glyphosate treatment. In fact, I'm proposing that we have two. So all of the tree spots will be glyphosated at the start of the season, and probably the oak will be done again during the season. So we have total rounded up costs of £6,300, and that comes down to about £1.36 per tree. So some final thoughts before we move on. As Poppy said, I'm passionate about planting trees. I've planted thousands at Glensoch, but I'm saying that as an industry, we need to get planting trees, and I'm, I'm really very sure that we need to be planting them by the thousand, not by the hundred, and that we need systems where we can plant thousands. So talking about systems, design your systems to be simple. If they're complicated, then they probably won't work because you won't have time to make them work. If you're placing new woodlands on your farms, then um, you're probably going to be looking at providing shelter from the north or northwest, or you live in the, or if you live in, say, Galloway, you might be looking at the southwest. But be very careful that you don't put your woodlands somewhere where they will cause a shading effect. So north and northwest sides of fields are pretty safe. Come back to this point about planting densely. We do want the trees to grow straight and tall, so plant them densely and thin them early, and you're probably going to be thinning from about year 10. So with that in mind, plant a mixture of short and long-term species, and some of those short-term species, the spruce will probably come out between years 10 and 20, and probably all by year 30. Please do take time to spray, to beat up, and to prune your trees. Um, Pruning is not a very popular job because people think it doesn't yield a benefit, but actually you can do a little bit of quick pruning and turn an unpromising tree into at least a better bit of firewood. And if you're short of time, then pay somebody else to do this early stage maintenance work. It will be well worth the investment. So that's been a quick romp through my thoughts from Glen Soch and an insight into how I think we might do farm forestry in the future. I'd be delighted to answer any questions if anybody has some issues that they'd like to air. Poppy, I'll hand back to you. Well, no, thank you, Donald. That was a brilliant talk, and I think you, you know, raised some really important points there. And I'm sure there'll be loads of questions. I'll first just ask Peter and John whether they've got anything they'd like to ask before I hand over to Poppy. Hi Donald, it's John. John here. Um, I'm I'm just interested that uh, you know you being based at Glen Sock, where there has been this um, agroforestry demonstration for so long that you, when designing new woodland at Glen Sock, you go down the route of blocks of woodland and not the classic agroforestry, um, and it's really just what has driven you down that route rather than the traditional agroforestry route? Okay, I'll, uh, it's a great point, John. I'll give you two reasons. One is that I think plastic is an abomination and 
Um, individual tree protection that requires plastic guards is to be avoided at all costs. Um, and my second reason is that um, the form and growth of trees planted at low density is in the main dreadful. And I don't get why it's worth growing trees that are going to be of such poor form at the end of the day. I, I'll give you a third reason as well, that Glensock extends to a thousand hectares. So it's been possible to dovetail in blocks of woodland extending to up to 10 hectares very easily without impacting at all on the livestock production on the farm. Um, so as I say, we've been planting trees by the thousand and the busiest tree planting year. Uh, I think we planted 20,000 trees. So can you imagine putting in 20,000 tree guards? It's simply not going to happen. That's great. Thank you very much, Donald. Thank you, Donald. Just on that, you, you know, the point about blocks of woodland, but you did say that your long term vision is to remove the spruce and have oak there and then graze that land or, or take it, use it for woodland shelter beyond there, which could be considered a more sort of traditional uh, agroforestry system. Just thinking though, after removing that spruce, are you envisaging there that you'd go and actually sow um, pasture again under the oak? Um, sort of long term, what, what's your thought about how you might revert it to a woodland grazing system? Uh, interesting question. No, there'll be no grass species sown there. But what will eventually evolve will be an oak understory, but that will be a long time in the future. So there's going to be an issue if we remove the Sitka spruce or Norway spruce, that it will create a vast amount of brash and that we're not going to want to put our livestock anywhere near that. So um, at some point after the brash has rotted down, then it may be possible and desirable to let the livestock back in again. But as I've said already, Glensoch has hundreds of hectares of grazing land. So losing a few hectares of grazing land is no big deal. Um, having said that, um, we know that woods that the sheep and cattle can access is useful shelter. So if, if that's an ultimate end point, then that would be a desirable place to go. But it's a long way in the future. OK, oh, thank you. Uh, Peter, just before I hand back to Poppy, Poppy, sorry, have you got anything to say? Yeah, uh, Donald, I was going to ask if you've ever considered or tried um, uh, using any prunings and, and loppings for um, tree hay with your livestock. I, uh, no, I haven't actually, tree hay. Um, I do know that um, livestock love to graze on the prunings. Um, some of them are highly palatable, but most of the prunings are left to mulch down at the feet of the trees that they've been dropped from. Mm -hmm. I, I like to prune my trees, and I'm very happy that the prunings should just rot back down into the understory. Um, I'm not too keen on having to drag stuff out of the woods if I can help it. And I make very good quality silage and haylage at Glensoch, so I'm never short of fodder for my sheep and cows. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm glad okay. you asked that, Peter, because that was uh, one of the questions that the audience asked. In fact, somebody suggested a uh, native ponies or cows, yes, to feed the pruning to the pruning. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just picking again, loads of great questions in there. Um, people were asking, you mentioned the benefits of the biodiversity, and I was wondering, or people were wondering whether that was measured. And were there, in terms of gain, but also was there any loss? Yes, in the original agroforestry experiment, they were they, they did bird surveys, and they also looked at insect life and um, counted the spiders' webs, and that sort of thing. So there's lots of data on that, um, but I, I I couldn't re recall it just at this moment. Fair enough. Um, and another question was people may be concerned about deer um, and the spark stripping in the early years, as it were, of, in the unprotected um, trees. It, it's a very good point, actually. And 
I'm thinking that in the vicinity of the steading, and actually the Mets field is only, let's say it's 100 yards from the steading, that deer stripping and browsing might not be too much of a problem. But um, in sites further out, it, it is a significant problem. And that, that's where some sort of um, cheap and cheerful individual tree net guard might still be required, even though we are not grazing livestock through the wood. And there's nothing more disheartening than planting a tree and finding that it's been damaged by a roe deer. And I'm just going to ask one more question, and again, apologies to those that we haven't got around to, um, but what advice would you offer to other farmers starting planting trees? Would you rather advise the more common sort of agroforestry, as John described, or this sort of block sacrificing um, part of the field? approach as you described. And I think, John, yeah, John, yeah if, you're, if you're planting trees on your farm for the first time, then keep it simple and plant the trees in a block and plant lots of them and use it as a learning exercise. Um, I, I would say that agroforestry is like the advanced course in forestry. Um, it's adding an embellishment to your farm, but and, and, and it may be creating a useful environment, but if you don't have much recent planting on your farm, then you really want to be getting the trees in by the thousand and creating significant blocks of shelter in the early, early days. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that, Donald. You've given a very good practical insight. In fact, one of the comments was saying this presentation is highly valuable to the new project going forward due to this practical um, insights into a long-term trial. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, great. Um, and so now I would like to introduce our last speaker of the evening. We're very fortunate to have Peter Livingston join us, who is um, who is co-founder of this uh, charity Air Enterprises, and he is one of the producers of Aspen and a big supporter of research and trials um, in terms of Aspen uh, use within Scotland. So I will hand over to you now. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Poppy, and good evening, everyone. I hope you can see my, my slides now. Um, so, AIA is the old Gaelic name for Aspen, and we've been working with Aspen for about 10 years now. Um, we're one of the UK's leading Aspen conservation charities, one of the few. And one of the main purposes of working with Aspen is really acknowledging its rarity, especially in our part of the world, in southern Scotland, but also understanding the potential of the species in many applications, including agroforestry. So really, we're keen to join uh, and develop this risk group, um, acknowledging that while farmers, landowners may have considered agroforestry, they may have overlooked the use of aspen. And indeed, many of its um, particular qualities lend itself quite nicely to, to agroforestry. So before I go on to look at uh, its use in agroforestry, um, I just want to run through quickly some of the, the natural history um, of the species to give you an idea about it. It's Scotland's only native poplar. It's dioecious, so either male or female trees. Importantly, it rarely flowers and produces seed, so it's a clonal tree. It spreads by suckering, typically uh, vegetatively, in the wild. Another key point is that it is, a, is one of the key pioneer species. So uh, the pre previous speakers um, highlighted the, the challenges of, of establishing trees um, in the uplands in particular, and on you know historically deforested land that may lack, that, that the soils may lack, that, that the crucial mycorrhizal fungi networks um, that trees require. But Aspen being a, being a pioneer doesn't require these and, and perhaps get away without maybe uh, the need for fertilizers and other such things. It is a keystone species um, in the boreal forest, so typically um, coexisting with things like birch and juniper and Scots pine in the Caledonian forest, but equally at home in the lowlands. And indeed, I mean, it's one of the most widespread species in the Northern Hemisphere. And in Scotland, can be found right from coastal up to the tree line. So basically, it grows anywhere. 
Yeah, ironically, it is one of the rarest species, and I mentioned uh, its rarity earlier, which prompted our work. We've been building up a clone uh, collection um, in this time, um, and we may have something like 20% of the entire uh, gene bank, if you like, of Aspen, <clears throat> and indeed 100% in, in, for southern Scotland. So this rarity uh, means it is highly prized in conservation terms, not only the tree itself, but more importantly, the microflora and fauna it supports. So five red data book species exclusively associated with Aspen. So a great tree um, in conservation and indeed landscape terms, a beautiful tree as well. And as I said, lots of niche applications. We know this because we can, we, we can look elsewhere in the world where Aspen is common and there are industries based on the use of Aspen from paper making, chipboards, fibre boards, right down to craft uses. So what does it look like in the wild? Well, typically in Scotland, and the, 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 the photos in the bottom there, it's found as single trees, often on solitary trees growing in a kind of deforested landscape, or um, where um, the grazing pressures are, are less, you'll see some mature trees, perhaps with a thicket of suckers. And it gives you an idea what it can do given the chance, but grazing pressures, unfortunately, are typically too high to allow these suckers to get away. Yet you only have to look to North America and Eastern Europe. And you can see contiguous aspen forests developing um, here in North America, the top photo in front of the, the spruce. And you can make out there the clonal blocks. As I said, it's a clonal tree, and that's very important because there's a lot of di genetic diversity between the clones, which can dictate anything from growth rates, form, colour, uh, timber properties. So that's very important. Indeed, part of our work is developing trials to understand some of these clonal variations in, in the aspen, and that could um, uh, also have a, a have a part to play in agroforestry. So why aspen specifically in uh, aspen agroforestry? Well, I, I think this photo was taken off the internet, perhaps somewhere in Europe. We don't have examples here, and no historical examples as such. Um, at least in a wood pasture system. But then again, it's not a, a long-lived tree. Ancient trees um, will have died out, and of course it can't replicate itself, so it probably just died out. But we only have to look to Norway to see that up to recent times, aspen was one of the key species in agroforestry. Um, the trees were pollarded in late uh, summer, and the branches tied to the trunks to dry off for winter uh, fodder. And we have some historical prints, uh, etchings, that suggest Aspen was pollarded in this country, therefore used. It does cast a light shade, and that's important, as the previous speakers mentioned, about maintaining pasture quality. Um, and so that's a key point for Aspen. Um, and also, being a pioneer species, um, and, and perhaps more than any other pioneer species, it does have it does seem to have particular benefits in soil quality, soil amelioration. I mean, we know the, the soils in the uplands in Scotland are typically depleted in things like nitrogen, calcium, organic matter, due to the, the, the kind of historic removal of, of livestock to markets in the lowlands. It seems that aspen can concentrate these elements and other things like zinc and sulphur quite uniquely uh, at high concentrations in bark and, and, and leaves. And these are then uh, recycled rapidly into the soils with, with, with the leaf fall. It can seem to it seems to sort of neutralize through through this process in the acidified soils as well. It is a productive species. I mean it is one of the native, if you like, biomass species. Um, and you can see in the, the charts there, um, this data was uh, published uh, by Forest Research that shows that aspen can potentially outcompete things like ash and birch uh, and alder in a short rotation forestry system, typically in a 15 year rotation. Um, but again, I mentioned before the clonal variation there, and it would be only the, the most productive cl superior clones that, that could, could out compete, but certainly um, lo looking very promising from a productive point of view. Uh, as I said earlier, one of its key characteristics is the suckering mechanism. And this is a survival mechanism, if you like, and, and, and it's a response to, to attack or stress. So trees will sucker if 
the ring barked by a, be uh, a beaver, for example, and, and John highlighted that earlier, counterintuitively, beavers actually might um, survive, might coexist with Aspen in a sort of symbiotic relationship and actually help Aspen by stimulating this, this suckering. But in interestingly, and perhaps an agroforestry point of view, coppicing, pollarding also has the same effect. And aspens, as I said, uh, have a very high conservation value. How do we manage them for biodiversity? Well, examples in the south of England, perhaps not here, suggest a uh, wide um, variation in age classes. So a, a, a coppice with standard system uh, is, is very beneficial. And so you have um, a thinning and, and then coppicing, um, and that stimulates the, the suckering. But just looking at that photo made me think about the potential for, say, rotational grazing through a thin woodland. And it got me thinking about the potential perhaps at Glen Sock and some of their proposed woodlands as well as Kirkton. Because looking at that, the ground flora there, I imagine a really her rich herb layer, which is supplemented by the, the additional nutrients found in the aspen suckers. And indeed, uh, it's why I asked the question earlier. It seems from my research that aspen uh, uh, is very high uh, in, in various nutrients. And I mean, we only ha have to look in the wild to why it is the favoured um, plant, the favoured tree for all the grazers. Unfortunately, um, to the challenge of, of establishing it, deer's fa deer favours aspen over anything else, the first tree they go to. And perhaps that's why it seems to have a very high, um, high fat and protein content, higher than hay. Um, the bark maintains carbohydrates during the winter um, due to ongoing photosynthesis and very high mineral content. And we're really keen to do uh, some actual research to, 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 show, to show this. There, there's, we have figures from North America, um, which I have to rely on, unfortunately, until then. Um, and I'll just quote some, some, some um, things here that suggest that ground and pelletized aspen could uh, account for as much as 48% of the diet of growing cattle. And 30% of steamed aspen could uh, also be used as a roughage substitute in the maintenance rations for sheep. So reading this uh, uh, from, from examples in North America, and I, I, I question why we don't have data for the populous tremula um, and not uh, uh, the, tr the American tremuloides. So I've been doing my little own uh, trials and pollarding a, a little tree that we planted not so long ago and fed it to a friend's horse who seemed to take to it uh, very nicely. So um, promising early signs, I would say. And the other thing, again, thinking about the uplands and the issues uh, facing farms, perhaps with uh, uh, steep topography is, is um, slope uh, and soil erosion. And this is a big issue, again, where we have depleted deforested land, big issue, you know, with siltation of rivers, et cetera. So slope, slope stabilization, poplars generally are planted for that, same as willows. And aspen in particular could have real benefits there wide laterally extending root systems and of course all those suckers really binding together soils. So again, I, I want to emphasize that we should be just looking at trees and and um, and livestock, but understand that as has been stressed much uh, b before uh, in this evening's event, that we need more trees basically full stop in the uplands because of all this, their ecosystem uh, services that they provide. And of course, biodiversity and the landscape benefits of aspen that I mentioned before that can really enhance uh, land holding. It's very tolerant to wet conditions, perhaps not quite as much as willow, not water logging, but damp, wet, wet places. It's a riparian species, so very at home along riverbanks, where of course those roots can stabilize uh, the, the banks. So again, thinking ahead, how can we integrate trees and livestock? Well, you know, let's use the aspen to perhaps solve some of the, the issues, the problems on, on, uh, on farms. So how might it look? How, what kind of design implications um, might, might there be um, seeing how it grows in the wild? Well, as I said, let's target really poor marginal areas, exposed areas, because we know there aspen will grow and survive. We know it can. 
we should perhaps emulate how wild aspen grows. Um, it's found as single trees, perhaps. So again, lends itself to the traditional agroforestry system, but at home in clonal blocks and contiguous woodland. Perhaps it should be considered as well as a nurse crop, maybe as or instead of things like spruce. It's a fast-growing pioneer, as I said, but it, it will uh, coexist with other species. And of course, I'm not advocating a monoculture, although aspen's our focus. Um, but one thing to consider is that it is shade intolerant, so it should perhaps be a, a woodland edge um, species. Perhaps not an issue with low plant, uh, low density planting uh, in agroforestry. And one thing that I uh, came to mind when I visited Glensaw is the, the 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 ability of the the conifer blocks to provide shelter for for winter for wintering livestock and that that obviously has huge cost savings um but also made me think how aspen and, and scots pine coexist as i said in the caledonia forest and from a landscape point of view but even perhaps a soil point of view could we look at integrating aspen and pine together perhaps in a system um it would look stunning let's face it but aspen would be at the edge, grading in to the solid pine in the core. So the pine providing that shelter and the aspens ameliorating the soils, enhancing the biodiversity and the landscape. So just an idea I would throw there and, and, and put to Donald. And we are doing our own trials um, in a, a more of a traditional forestry system, mixed silviculture with aspen and various other conifers. And we're, we're doing these, planting these trials, well, we were before the lockdown, um, because we know this is practiced at places like North America and Scandinavia. We're also planting our first agroforestry system as such with Aspen, but it's also a, an arboretum um, and a sort of clone bank. So it, it has the traditional agroforestry look. We're replicating the full clone bank of Galloway, which is 32 clones, replicating that twice across the seven hectare field, Craig and Gillen Estate in East Ayrshire. Um, so it's an organic um, mixed farm. And the the, seed, the 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 field has fortunately been reseeded with a native grass and wildflower mix, so it's going to look nice. And the aspens will enhance that. We're we're, we're building um, so uh, six by six meter enclosures, uh, rylock netting with twin uh, timber rails. Uh, unfortunately, this project was funded by the Future Trees Trust and the Woodlands Trust um, as a, as a kind of trial demonstration project. And, in, and interestingly, the pear tree price comes out very similar to John's in his agroforestry uh, trial, which is about £25 a tree. Not cheap. But again, I would emphasise the high upfront costs of agroforestry are, are taken. We need to look at the grants, how that's supported. But what we need to see is the long term benefits of having more trees in, in, in the uplands and in the countryside generally, and all those ecosystem services that often aren't quantified to the full. This is how Craig and Gillen will look in the end. And well, we, it should have been planted by now, but alas, um, situations uh, uh, got the better of us, uh, as we all know. And even hedging, uh, we're doing a small hedge trial with Aspen and Craig and Gillen, um, having seen some Aspen, overgrown Aspen hedges, um, this one in Cumbria, um, well, why not? And we do have some dwarfing clones that might actually lend themselves. Popular culture, again, on holiday, seeing the popular culture, if you like, in, in France, wondered, well, why not Aspen? Um, maybe it lends itself more to a, 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 an arable system that, that, than pastoral, but but um, perhaps we can learn from these, these uh, existing systems. So utilisation and harvesting. So we know uh, short rotation forestry is the typical rotation of aspen. And uh, we can coppice it as well, which creates a really rich biodiverse uh, woodland setting that could lend itself to, to, to grazing. There's questions over funding of that and, and the viability, of course, the grant support. Would it be mechanical or manual harvesting, these kind of issues? But the suckers, um, I would re-emphasise, that clearly uh, can lead to that additional benefit of, of, of forage for, for livestock. And if we manage it properly, perhaps with some temporary fencing, rotational grazing, mob grazing is becoming very uh, popular now, or increase, increasingly um, popular, um, and that could perhaps be integrated some of the, the traditional uh, harvesting techniques, and I would add the third being, being a shredding 
and of course this all gives us sort of small diameter uh, wood which of course we've got to think of secondary products um, typically biomass chipping for biomass but aspen as well um, can be a product uh, can be um, can produce uh, or be used for animal bedding so again perhaps a pelletizer producing biomass pellets but also bedding uh, pellets as well um, might, might be a, a viable option. Uh, typically, it was used for, for bedding in some areas um, for horses, uh, as well as domestic animals uh, and even reptiles. So maybe there's potential there. What what what, could, what would um, Polardy Aspen look like? Well, top uh, left it shows a polar, an Aspen Pollard in the continent. Poplars generally are Pollardy in traditional systems. And I think the, 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 the photo in the right was from Glen Sock, clearly shows someone, I think, shredding uh, a tree. I don't know, correct me there. So what might it look like? Um, this photo, the, we, have, we can look at existing um, examples where clones have been protected, a riparian strip of aspen surviving along the riverbank. We only have to fence a, a, a small area and get a huge amount of growth. The aspens will take care of that. We don't have to plant anything. The suckers will, will spread. And you can imagine opening that fence and allowing livestock grazing young shoots. It's all about how we rotate the grazing, but potentially a brilliant ha a habitat. And importantly, thinking about natural flood protection, it's all about increasing the roughness of the land. And what's striking, I think, when we look at maybe some of the Glen Sog photos and um, Kirkton as well, that a highly grazed um, um, area under the trees. Um, apparently, research suggests that it's the same amount of runoff as an open bare um, field. So it's important to consider how rough maintain the ground flora of a woodland and just rotate grazing and be quite sort of sensitive to get those ecological uh, environmental benefits. I'm thinking also taking the, the the pressures off of ancient woodland where we know there's a big pressure of overgrazed ancient woodlands. We're losing that rich ground flora. Let's let's position um, agroforestry and in particular a, a kind of woodland planting that, that, that Donald was talking about doing at Metz Field um, adjacent to existing uh, ancient woodland and fence that ancient woodland off. Maintain maintain the the, the 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 barriers there, protect it, and you use the agroforestry as a buffer. But of course, potentially also as as a landscape and ecological um, network, and that's where I think it can really benefit. And of course, utilising existing fences saves saves costs a lot. And perhaps in looking at traditional wood pasture systems in the uplands, well, we only have to look at aspen and. Uh, what, what it, uh, where it can grow, what it can do, um, high elevation in the Cairngorms, we have this this beast surviving, which suggests that you know it's a it's a tough and resilient tree, and um, can really produce a lot of biomass. Let's face it, in really tough conditions. And I'll leave I'll leave that photo with you and um, open up uh, to questions. So I hope that was interesting. That's, that's brilliant, Peter. Really quite inspiring. Um, so I'm sure lots of us be going off and planting lots of aspen, but uh, I'll just open up first of all to Donald and, and John, whether you've got any questions, um, and then I'll hand over to Poppy. Yeah, question from Donald here. Um, Peter, do you think aspen would associate well with oak? Um, you know, I'd been talking about using spruce as my short term nurse crop. How would aspen suit? Well, I've no specific experience of the two coexisting together, but I, I don't see why why not. Um, it, it would be at least as good as spruce, would be my argument, I suppose. But just, just come back with another point to reflect on. When I cut the spruce down, that's it dead. When I cut the aspen down, it, is it going to throw up loads of suckers? And w will it be there forever? <laughs> Yeah, that is a good question. It all depends on how quickly the oak gets away and is then able to shade out the aspen suckers, and they will be shaded out, and uh, the aspen will move. It will still be retained, if you like. The, 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 the roots will remain viable in the ground, and growth will obviously be restricted to the edges, and that's really the, the, the traditional cyclical 
um, way that it maintains itself, but more more so with the the conifers and the boreal forest in, in these cycles. But I don't see why why not with oak. You know, again though, you could protect your oaks perhaps and let in the grazing to take off the the aspen suckers. So may, maybe there's ways to manage that. That's a very good point. Thank you. Uh, if John, are you still there? If you got a question, or shall I hand over I, to I, Paul Peter? I've just just got one quick question. Um, it, it's really to do with the availability of aspen, and because it it doesn't produce a lot of seed, you know, the the stock is coming from often from suckered plants, and uh, they tend to be expensive, and it's quite often difficult to get local locally genetic stock um, do you think that's going to change in the future do you think that it's going to be easier to get aspen yeah well like, we're doing our best put, put, put it that way um so i mean a lot, a lot of our work has has concentrated on an enabling production to sort of ramp up so um basically we've got um 50 of our clones in production via micropropagation and then being grown on by um alban chivia trees and so we uh, uniquely have you know a scottish uh, collection of clones in production but yes you're totally right it's an expensive process we, we just cannot compete with birch for example but we do have uh, numbers available and uh, you know but but they mostly go quite quickly so there is there are trees available but I, I, it comes down to the argument of why aspen is it that much better than planting for example a birch um and we have to argue the case of productivity and that those those productive benefits in the second rotation where you have that sucker growth you know giving you so much more biomass for example 15 stems per stump um, is what you get if you, if you if you focus, you know, harvest an aspen. So you get more trees back at the end, at the end it, it, long term benefits, as well as all the other sort of nutritional benefits are highlighted and, and using the suckers in a process and a system. Um, so that we've got to look at the kind of bigger picture. And of course, well, you know, just loving aspen, but also, the, you know, the landscape and the conservation value. You, to me, let, you know, justifies that, that price. But yeah, it, there's always a constraint there, I think. That's great. Well, Thanks, Helen. Yeah, that actually um, was a great question, John. And it was actually one of our audience asked that for, in regards to higher yielding aspen clones. Um, I, think, I think that addresses that. So thank you. Um, there was a question regarding um, what references or what evidence you have for Aspen to improving biodiversity. Do you know of any, or is it more of a anecdotal or observational reference? Well, we, we do know that there are a lot of um, ecologists working working Aspen, um, and a lot of the, the particularly the, the, the species exclusively related to Aspen, like the Aspen hoverfly and the Aspen bristle moss, and all these particular species. Um, that are typically only found in, in Strath's Bay, and there's been a, you know, a, a lot of experts researching this and the best habitats you know, for these and the best management prescriptions. But generally speaking, um, you know, it, it, the, yes, there's hard and fast data that shows that it supports more flora and fauna than any other species, including things like the oak. So, I mean, there's lists I can forward of, of all these species. Um, so, that yeah, the data basically set, says it all. Um, there were a couple of people concerned about the lack of protection for likes of deer and beaver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's you know an inevitability of trying to establish aspen, um, and we've we've come across that. So I, I would envisage perhaps the most economic system just being a, a conventional woodland creation scheme at, at typical native woodland densities, as as, as Donald envisaged, with a deer fence and an a vole guard. Um, uh, you know, and then year year ten or whatever after establishment, um, you know, let some grazing in and let let nature take its course, um, and you know, it'll hopefully get away. Because as I said, the, then the more grazing and the and the more pressure on the on the, the mature trees, the more it will sucker. And I mean, interestingly, the beavers. Anecdotal evidence uh, from 
a well-known uh, beaver enthusiast in the in the, in the Tay area. Um, what that, that has been working with beavers for a long time has aspens on his land. They coppice the aspen on a eight to ten year basis. Nature will tell us what the best rotation is for a for a tree. They won't touch the suckers. They will leave them alone until they're big enough. Uh, as uh, as John mentioned, you know beavers will typically only take a, a semi mature tree, and that's indeed what what, what is seen to be the case. Um, so that's that that's quite an interesting observation. Fantastic. Um, and there was another thing, if it was unpollarded, would it become unpollarded, would it become um, overgrown for stock? And also on that note, what age would you think about letting stock into forest, forested areas? If you, I'm, I'm, I'm aware you're not a livestock manager, so perhaps yeah. others might be able to help with that as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, this is all just from my own researches, um, with not, not any particular experience of, of this. So I can't really answer um, the, 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 the question, um, the, the first question. Um, in terms of letting stock in, um, again, you know, I would, I would say it's similar to, to other species, um, you know, that after that, that kind of establishment phase, I would suggest, you know, let, letting stock in, you know, probably be, behave similarly to, to, to comparable species like birch. So, I would let let the others uh, comment too. Uh, so Donald or John, would you have any comment on that as well? Please? Yeah, I, I, I'm here, Poppy. I'll come in with a quick comment on when can you let stock into a woodland? So year 10 is definitely too soon. And the agroforestry researchers at Glen Sock were always terrified to do it. They probably not before year 15. I'll, I'll just come in there as well because it means means a fin tree um andrew barber there they, they actually did let sheep in um probably actually before year 10 but they were very careful about it and and you know it's very much control grazing they'd let them in briefly and bring them out um so you need that intensity of management and care for the livestock to to judge that correctly and certainly the cattle weren't going in at year 10 they were going in much later that, can i just say that that's quite an interesting figure the 15 year because of course that was a rotation um of of the aspen and a biomass system so perhaps year 16 i would suggest that um you know, you you then thin uh, and coppice the aspen at, at 15, leaving the standards. Give give the suckers a year, two years to get away, and then let the livestock in, uh, as that 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 photo of coppice and standards uh, illustrated. Thank you, and I just I think there's a very important point uh, made about um, being thinking about different outputs from the trees. So someone made the comment that it's sad to think that it's carbon being stored just to be burnt. So making sure that we're thinking innovatively about different outputs. Are there any others that the panel can think of at the moment? Um, and well, or whether we need to, that seems to be sort of a focus, a point within our project work going forward, perhaps. Um, and then another comment on output focus, the vast majority of forests uh, products and timber that we use in the, in the UK is softwood from conifer forests. So should we be so focused on broadleaf with that in mind? And that would be like an open question to all our speakers if anyone's willing to answer or comment. Well, I... I'm not qualified to answer that, but I, I would say that we we've probably not focused much in this country on growing quality broadleaf timber. The, and another point that I do know for a fact is that a lot of high quality oak in particular was lost to First World War felling. And that is one of the reasons why Glen Soch has got so little aged timber that most of it was essentially raided by the government. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in as well on that. Um, I think the products from agroforestry, I think Donald's very much highlighted the need to grow straight trees of, of good quality uh, if you're going to sell into other markets other than firewood. 
um, and and you've really got to think about how you're going to grow those trees well, um, as, as Donald's clearly demonstrated. Um, I, you know, broad leaves, yeah, particularly in Scotland, there's not a well-developed market. Um, there are local markets, oak especially, there's always a high demand for oak if you can grow oak. So, you know, Glensoch, if they're, they're able to grow oak, is worth <laughs> thinking long-term. It's going to be a very long-term product to grow those. I know I've quoted Mains of Fintry again, the, the, the uh, growing oak there for use on the farm, uh, for timber fencing and that sort of thing, which is great if you can do it. Um, yeah, birch and so on, there's, there's limited um, markets available for that other than firewood at the moment. Um, but, you know, those, there's no reason why those cannot, that cannot change in the long term. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't discount planting softwoods in agroforestry systems, but again, thinking about how they're planted for better quality timber. Just, I'd like to add that um, maybe not an agroforestry system, but forestry generally, uh, the largest uh, EU invest, industrial investment, I think, in the early 2000s was a paper mill in Estonia, which took uh, purely aspen as a feedstock. So basically, it's a chicken and the egg. If we've got the aspen, it, it's, a, it's a superior uh, feedstock um, over and above uh, spruce pulp. So, um, you know, <laughs> there's potential there, uh, I would suggest. But again, it's just a chicken and egg. It's the production issues, the, the price, all of these things, deer, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, as I said, this, this whole industry is based on the thing. So, Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. We are running a little bit late, so I think we will um, end it there. But I just want to say, well, just a kind of couple of comments and things that I've heard uh, in practice too. Apparently Shropshire sheep, they don't graze trees, so they would be very well suited to these types of systems. So I know they're used in, well, someone mentioned Christmas tree plantations, but in fruit tree orchards as well. So uh, that's a, a one to think about. Um, I would just like to say thank you very much to our excellent speakers. I've been inundated with so many questions and I know Fanwell have not addressed, we've not addressed all of them, um, but it's something we will make sure, ensure um, if we can, we will come back to. Um, and it's just a sign of how well engaged our audience have been. So I would just like to say thank you so much to John, Donald and Peter for delivering such excellent presentations and some excellent ideas. I would like to urge our attendees, please, 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 can you complete our survey um, just to help us understand further the challenges, uh, the quality of delivery, but also how we should um, refine this project going further. If you have any more, if you'd like any more information, um, here are our email addresses um, online. Um, and I just thought I'd end with, we've heard from such a wide range of different ideas and it was intentional to put um, the perspectives of the research uh, done at Kirkton alongside Glen Sock um, and with the Aspen work too, um, to understand really what I'm putting across is it's horses for courses. It's going to be different approaches for different farm systems. At Kirkton, only 70 hectares of the whole 2,200 hectare farm is in by. So that's an important resource for the farm and part of the argument for integrating forestry into the grassland as opposed to um, a defined uh, brook um, as was seen at, at Glensock. So it very much is um, thinking of the farm and thinking of design that will suit the whole farm system. And lastly, I just wanted to um, bring about this other comment from my esteemed research colleague, uh, Professor David McCracken. Scottish agriculture does need to reduce its emissions by 17% uh, by 2032. And it is on track to meet uh, the net zero by 2045. Changes to farming practices will help, but woodland creation will be essential on farm to offset the remaining emissions from livestock. So this project in agroforestry in general is a really key concept that needs to be kept in the mix. So that said, um, I want to again thank you all for, for joining us this evening. I hope you found it worthwhile and I hope to keep in touch with some of you into the future and with this project work. So thank you. Thank you to our speakers and thank you to you all. Thanks Poppy. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Poppy. much. It's brilliant.